Across the country, ordinary Americans from all walks of life are taking whatever measures necessary to prepare. I'm preparing my family for the total destruction of the power grid. The Yellowstone supervolcano. A financial collapse. And protect themselves. And survival's the goal, it's into the spider hole. Go fast, 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 fast. Go, 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 go. From what they perceive is the fast approaching end of the world as we know it. So I'm gonna use like this. Next, we go inside the lives of three committed preppers. Make your life miserable. Who've devised extensive plans. Turn the mealworms into a big meal. Gone to great lengths. Welcome to the Armageddon Inn. I want everyone to react as if your lives are on the line. And made huge personal sacrifices to ensure their very survival. Maxi pads, which can act as bandages. I certainly don't want to have to be killing my neighbors. Go upstairs. The experts will assess their extreme preps and decide if they have what it takes to face Armageddon. Everybody grab the gun they want. And to survive. Slam the bolt closed and you load up the shotgun. This is Doomsday Preppers. John Major recently moved his family to Idaho to get away from it all. We moved from Utah to have a little more space and freedom. A trained marksman and avid outdoorsman, John enjoys the country life. I don't do a lot of things that other people spend a lot of their time doing. I don't do a lot of sports, I don't golf. And he shares his love of nature with his kids. Look at that. So here you have the chicory. Why don't you check under that one? But the purpose of this hike is not to admire local foliage. Anything? Uh, there's a cricket. You gonna eat it? Um, sure. Tastes like frozen cricket. Mm -hmm. It's like all crunchy and then it is like... Cream filled. John is teaching his kids how to survive doomsday by learning to forage and eat bugs. My doomsday scenario is a series of dirty bomb attacks in the US. Dirty bombs combine conventional explosives like dynamite with radioactive material to scatter radiation around a large area. A single dirty bomb detonated in an urban center can kill hundreds and expose thousands more to radiation. Panic and chaos are all but certain to follow, and cleanup could take months. I feel that there are several entities in the world that would attack sovereign US soil with a dirty bomb, anywhere from low-level terrorists to rogue states. Radioactive materials go unsecured and unaccounted for all around the world, making dirty bombs relatively easy to build and a constant threat. John believes a series of coordinated nationwide attacks could spread radioactive dust throughout the environment, contaminating the food chain and causing massive food shortages. A dirty bomb is going to disrupt our food supply because most of our food is going to be irradiated by the bomb, so food will be scarce. You want to see what mealworms look like? John is determined to prepare his wife Heidi and their five kids for a time when normal food sources may not be available. Do you want one with a bug in it? Yeah. Even if it means eating outside the box. My family gets a kick out of eating the bugs. Grab me what? the crickets. I am trying out a new recipe on my crickets with onion. Probably cover them in a little Parmesan cheese. It's wiggling my mouth. <laughs> Actually, pretty good. John stores thousands of frozen insects in his freezer, safe from the effects of a dirty bomb, which he believes could contaminate both crops and animals outside. Even when I was giving my answer to him for the prom, he was coming out of the field with his gun, and I knew what I was getting into, I guess, from the beginning. But. Not too many families go and eat bugs together as a family activity. Kaylee, would you grab me a handful more of crickets, please? Is this bug stew? There are roughly 1,462 edible species of insects. And while they may not look appetizing, 
These crickets boast an average of 13 grams of protein each, making them a superfood. We're gonna turn the mealworms into a big meal. <laughs> the ability to survive with nearly nothing gives you a lot of freedom. Whoa, look at the huge one! Oh, yeah, that, that one's good. mine. Crunchy? I cook my insects because I do have some standards for taste. Insecto parmesan. Yep. A lot of other kids think it's weird to eat bugs, but I think it's nummy. Go ahead and serve up, guys. I didn't really have a big problem with it. I mean, it's just food. What do you guys think? It's good, Dad. I believe other people with whom I rub shoulders on occasion think I am obsessed. For John, prepping is not just a hobby, but a full-time job. He sells emergency seed banks that can be used after a dirty bomb attack. After doomsday, these seeds will help people provide for themselves in the aftermath of the tragedy. John's seed banks include a variety of vegetable seeds designed to provide maximum nutrition. Today, John and his colleague David are sorting individual seed packets. Our initial packet comes with an acre full of seed, 37,000 seeds in 23 varieties. Each pack will provide a family with enough radiation-free seeds to grow vegetables for four years. I believe that as you help other people's needs, a lot of times your own needs are fulfilled. Look at this, that's perfect. Here in the United States, it's more people prepared than in Mexico. I never heard about that in my country. So we had that order of 3,500. Wow, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great. We days to fulfill it. That's a big sale. Tal vez suficiente para alimentar a todo México. Oh, wow, that's a great idea. <laughs> Seeds are a perfect prepper resource because when saved correctly, they can last for hundreds and even thousands of years. They have more better like you And John doesn't expect business to slow down post-apocalypse. In fact, he considers his seeds the perfect doomsday currency. I myself have 1.5 million seeds in my current inventory. In a down society, we're going to be bartering. John expects a coordinated series of dirty bomb attacks to create chaos and panic. And while he wants to provide others with the means to help themselves, he will not do it at the expense of his own stores. After the explosions go off, people would be in a lot of panic. Anyone that has food and shelter is going to be a target on Doomsday. So to keep his most valuable prep secure from roving marauders, John follows the prepper rule of multiple and secret storage locations. Right now I have three seed banks buried around the property in different cache locations. Assuming the attack of a dirty bomb is successful, we need to bury the seeds so that we can have something to go and restart with. John buries his seed banks for two reasons. Compact earth is one of the most effective shields against radiation. Every six inches of earth reduces radiation exposure by a factor of two. Burying the seed banks underground also controls their temperature, allowing them to last longer. That's going to keep the seeds cold. They'll last up to a good 10, 15 years in this climate. And for John, security goes beyond good hiding places. So he wants each member of his family to be able to defend their preps and themselves using a variety of weapons. When Love the Jungle kind of reigns, at that point, every individual is responsible for his own security. I have at least 15, hundred rounds of ammo, and I have 30 weapons at my disposal. Okay, everybody grab the gun they want. Good choice, Brianna. I take my kids practice shooting as early as I can get them interested. Brianna, here you go. The majors prefer 22 or 410 caliber guns because they take only two different types of light and widely available ammo. A prepper advantage, not only because they are easy to carry, but also easy to replenish in a crisis. By seven years old, all my kids have shot guns. So why are we preparing to shoot? To protect yourself. Protect yourself? Good, security. Shooting is a very important thing when you're trying to survive. All right. Things will be getting a lot tougher in the future for us. We need to protect each other, protect ourselves, and uh, keep bad people from doing bad things, right? Go ahead and load. The range is hot, fire when ready. I would protect my family with all means possible. 
and I don't feel I need permission from anyone to do that. There's really nothing off the table in my book. Come on, hurry, hurry. For John, defense is not just about shooting. He has created a military security plan for his home. To protect from rioting marauders, we head to the foxhole. A foxhole is known in the military as a defensive fighting position. It allows soldiers to keep watch over an area while remaining undercover. Take your weapon. It would be a way to provide surprise surveillance. They're going to approach the home thinking that they're only having to worry about people inside the home. But before he can protect his family, John wants to make sure they can survive the radioactive aftermath of a dirty bomb blast. I want everyone to react as if your lives are on the line. So today, he's about to put his family to the test of their lives. Father of five, John Major, is preparing his family to survive a series of nationwide dirty bomb attacks that he believes will threaten infrastructure and contaminate food sources. The series of dirty bombs would cause the society to have a meltdown just because of the sheer panic people would feel. My dad is a be prepared guy. He's different from other dads. We're going to come over here, and you guys just immediately run up the stairs, OK? The government suggests sheltering in place in order to avoid contact with radiation. Brianna, where are you going? You have to grab from here. So the majors have formulated a detailed bug-in plan, which they practice at least twice a year. To take care of our own security, we run drills on a very regular basis, make sure that everyone's ready and knows ahead of time how we're going to react. What are we doing the drill for? We have had a dirty bomb go off here close to us, so we need to get out of the regular environment. Everything needs to be executed as if it's real. I want everyone to react as if your lives are on the line, OK? The majors have adapted one of the rooms in their house into a shelter zone. So as soon as they hear of a nearby attack, they can retreat into safety. All right, guys, it started. We have a fallout. Stay here, orderly, control. We grab all the supplies we need. Go upstairs. Our bug out bags and filtration for water, and we run up to the room and seal it off. The whole time, I'm just thinking, if this was a real emergency, we'd have to be as fast as we could ever get. They can control their environment by taping up windows and doors. Be careful with your knife. Reducing the chance of radiation seeping in. We also have a pump system that can make sure that any of the air being sucked in from the environment is clean before it enters the room. A ventilation system like John's increases the positive air pressure in the room, keeping any air from outside out and making sure the only air coming in is through a safe filter. When I pumped the air, it felt like I was helping my family. Some people don't think that you need to have all these drills and bug out bags. They'll think they're weird. You need to make practice. Practice makes perfect. John expects that they may have to stay in their shelter zone for weeks, maybe months. So while there, he'll use sprouting seeds to keep his family alive. I would start sprouting immediately. Sprouted seeds, seeds that have only just begun to grow, are packed with vitamins and protein. A single serving of broccoli sprouts can offer up to 100 times more nutritional benefits than mature broccoli. Soak them for 24 hours. The sprouting seeds in their bug out bags will feed the family for two weeks. But ultimately, John believes he may have to dig into their cached seed banks before it is safe to go outside. So he has a specially designed suit ready. If we have a dirty bomb holocaust here, the filtration suit is going to protect you by stopping particulates in the air that would get down into your lungs. So as we leave our sanctuary in the room, we'll dig up the seeds we need and just get out of Dodge as fast as we can. And if things do go south in a big way, John has found the perfect vehicle to get his family out of danger, a retired ambulance. We have a van 
the bug out mobile. It's an old ambulance so that if we need to leave in a hurry, it's already most of the way packed. Our plan would be to flee either north or south due to the, most of the winds going east and west. Can we just bring out our bug out bags and off we go. Given the historical and current threat levels, I do not believe I am obsessed with prepping. I feel a lot freer when I've reached a certain independence in providing for the needs and comforts of the family. John, the experts at Practical Preppers have identified several pros and a few cons to your preps. Your food and water preps are excellent, and you have gone the extra mile by preparing your family to live off the land by foraging. Also, your firearms will serve not only for protection, but also for hunting. However, while your remote location reduces the immediate threat of attack, we suggest investing in a ham or shortwave radio to ensure you are able to maintain communication with the outside world. I agree with that fully. I think ham radio is uh, extremely useful and I do intend on getting my license to operate the ham and have one in possession. All right, hey Nat Geo, just a quick update on a couple things we've improved since the show. We've got in uh, a particle mask that will adjust to nearly any face, which is better than a traditional gas mask. I have one for an adult and also for child. And we got an AK-47 with some ammo. And we got 60 grain 22 ammo for the long rifle. Since 9-11, anti-terror governmental agencies have been on the lookout for potential dirty bomb attacks because producing such a device is relatively simple and inexpensive, and their psychological impact could be great. However, a dirty bomb's blast would likely cause more damage than the radiation it spreads. Janet Spencer has been prepping for a nuclear attack in her home state of Montana for seven years. But how prepared is she? Janet Spencer is an author living in Helena, Montana, two hours north of Yellowstone National Park, and two hours south from 150 nuclear weapons operated at Maelstrom Air Force Base in the city of Great Falls. Janet believes this missile arsenal is one of the largest in the world and the perfect target for an enemy nuclear bomb. If someone wanted to take out our capabilities of retaliatory nuclear strikes, they would just take out Great Falls. Preparing for disaster is the only safe and sane thing to do. When a nuclear bomb falls, Everybody within a one mile radius of ground zero will die. There will be heavy casualties within a three mile radius due to radiation burns. There is no more power. What water there is may be radioactive. If you look at a nuclear blast as it's happening, you go blind. It's tragic now that we no longer teach duck and cover. Only two nuclear bombs have been used on people. Nagasaki and Hiroshima. They sure didn't get any warning, did they? Those who did survive the bomb released over Hiroshima, Japan in 1945 were left homeless and fled. Janet believes the same displacement will occur in Montana, so she keeps others at the forefront of her prepping plan. I began preparing to be able to help as many people for as long as possible. 90% of the people in Great Falls would die. That would still leave 6,000 people that survive. Heading over the hill to my town, what I intend to do here is taking care of evacuees. Janet thinks the survivors will come to her city because radioactive fallout from a bomb detonated in Great Falls would travel downwind, away from Helena. The only place for them to go would be Helena. We are the closest population center that is upwind. Janet preps her home, nicknamed the Armageddon Inn, alone. But she does not live alone. She and her husband Jerry have been married for 30 years, but even after three decades together, 
not all of their interests are in sync. When my husband looks at my constant efforts at this, he is a little bit bewildered. I don't think the nuclear threat is nearly as real as it used to be. In fact, I would rather believe there's going to be some great breakthroughs in energy technology. I'm going to take the dog for a walk. I do a lot of my prepping behind his back. I will know if he's going out. I have two hours to get my preps done before he gets back. Come on, Elsie. Today, as she routinely does, Janet is taking advantage of Jerry's absence to work on the largest food storage area in their home, beneath their California king-sized bed. There's nothing to give you peace of mind like sleeping on top of a metric ton of food. Janet knows nuclear fallout would deposit in soil and create a massive disruption in food supplies. So she has collected several thousand canned goods and over 200 pounds of rice and pasta. I probably have spaghetti enough to feed 1,000 people, beans enough to feed 2,000 people. Her spaghetti and macaroni collection alone would be enough to feed over 15% of the victims who might make the trek to Helena. My hobby is collecting spaghetti, and that's considered borderline insane. I consider it the safest and sanest thing I can possibly do. Janet has spent the last four years stacking cans in 42 square feet by maximizing every single square inch. But the space has finally reached its full capacity. This is the day when I'm going to call this bed full, and I'm going to close it up, seal it for the final time. Janet still has time to prep while Jerry is away. But to keep her vast and constantly growing supply out of his sight, she will need to find a new storage option. You wouldn't normally think of a bathroom door as being a storage spot, but I think I could probably fit a whole bunch of soup packets into this door. There's a lot of tricks and tips that I use just to, to get around the fact that he doesn't support it and, and to prevent that friction from happening. That's enough onion. I'm going to switch to chicken noodle. That might do it. Anyone cleaning out my house after I'm dead is going to think I was really strange. I ended up getting 70 soup packets in there. The most hazardous nuclear fallout descends within 24 hours, but the finest grains can travel long distances carrying radiation with them. Janet believes this dust could float into her home, so she has added a layer of wood for additional protection. I think it's going to hold. You want as many layers between you and the outside world of radiation as possible. Janet's innovative hiding techniques don't just save her marriage. They double as her security plan against desperate people she believes may ransack her home in search of supplies. I hide my food because if I have vandals come in after a disaster, I want to be able to just walk away from the situation and come back later and find all the food that they've missed because they didn't think of looking there. In case Janet does not survive the nuclear blast, she keeps a written account of the Armageddon Inn that will serve as a guidebook to locate her preps and what would be her first aid station. If I don't survive, I do want the people who survive me to be able to utilize what I've stored here. This is my drop ceiling. I like to pack good stuff into it whenever Jerry's away for a little while. This is one of my most super secret hiding spaces that only I know about. Janet is packing her drop ceiling with first aid kits because she believes many survivors at the inn will require medical attention from the bomb blast, which would shatter windows, sending glass shards through the air at 100 miles per hour. When the shock wave hits you, your windows are gonna shatter into a thousand pieces. To dress lacerations from flying debris, Janet stocks up on an absorbent medical item made from cellucotton, which is five times more effective than ordinary cotton. Lots of maxi pads, which can act as bandages. Maxi pads are very absorbent. They're sterile. They are very cheap. And so I stock up on a lot of those. Because Jerry could arrive home at any minute, Janet cannot complete putting away more supplies in her drop ceiling today.
when he comes home, he says, hi, honey, how was your day? I say, oh, it was good. I just read a book and fiddled around on the computer. And I would just kind of fail to mention that I happened to line the back closet with canned goods while he was gone. I've seen over the years how much she's been collecting, putting things in strange places. I mean, if the end of the world as we know it does ever occur, it'll all come in handy. I'm not thrilled, but it's there. It's part of us. But how will Janet escape radiation sickness if the bomb blast happens? Janet Spencer has spent seven years preparing for a nuclear attack that would devastate Great Falls, Montana, and send thousands of evacuees to her hometown of Helena. She has enough food to feed over 1,000 people and a security plan in place, but her husband of 30 years does not share her prepping interest. My husband is uh, part of the population that feels that it's not his job to be ready for a disaster, but I can pinpoint the instant that I became concerned about disasters. 4.59 a.m. on February 2nd in 1989. I woke up by an awful explosion that blew my door open. Helena Fire Department. Uh, there's a train collision on uh, Benton Avenue. How long ago did you hear it? Just now. Just now? Yeah, a yeah. big explosion. A train exploded catastrophically in the middle of Helena, Montana, completely shattering my city. There was a cataclysmic fire. There was no power, there was no heat. The phone was not working, and I had no idea what was going on or what I should do. Then I thought I would tune into the radio for the emergency broadcast system to come on. But all of the radio stations were off the air. The authorities were absurdly unprepared. From that point forward, I don't think I would ever again in my life trust someone else to handle the situation. I can either be prepared for a disaster or not. That's the only thing I can control. Because of her past experience, preparing for a communications breakdown during a nuclear catastrophe is one of Janet's main priorities. Whenever there's a nuclear bomb blast, it will blow out the fuses and the wiring of any electrical appliance. A secondary effect of a nuclear explosion is called an electromagnetic pulse, or EMP, a sudden burst of high voltage energy that damages electronic devices and would bring communication to a standstill. If you want to have communication, if you want to have radios that still work after a nuclear blast, you need to get them protected by a Faraday cage. A Faraday cage is a sealed metal container which creates a barrier against an EMP surge by forcing the electrical current around instead of through the structure. Faraday cages are ridiculously simple to build. I can build a Faraday cage in 20 minutes. Many preppers spend hundreds of dollars building Faraday cages, but Janet searches for materials with a limited budget in mind. Perfect Faraday cage. Definitely worth a dollar. Being able to have an electronic devices after an EMP, priceless. In a 2010 national poll, over 50% of respondents said they fear a nuclear attack in the next 40 years. But Janet worries she is the only one preparing in Helena, so she tries to get others on board. Today, she is giving her friend Kathleen a Faraday cage tutorial. So what is this Faraday cage anyway? Well, a Faraday cage will protect your electronics in the event of an electromagnetic pulse. So after the electromagnetic pulse, you'll be able to use whatever's in here? You should, if we do it right. OK, so we have a metal box. Now we need to line it so that all of the things inside of it um, have no chance whatsoever of touching the metal. Because metal conducts electricity, the interior of the box must be insulated with the material that would break the transfer of electromagnetic waves. You can do that with something as simple as a pad of newspapers. Uh, my favorite thing to do is to use uh, styrofoam. Let's see, here's these two walkie-talkies, right? Janet has 50 walkie-talkie radios and scanners in case the Helena Police Department lose communication capabilities after an EMP. I always figured if worse came to worse, I would just go down and provide the police force with a new set of radios. I have AM, FM radios up the wazoo. Janet is sealing the seams of the box with aluminum tape, 
which is conductive and will aid in turning the metal tote into a veritable shield. And the final step is placing the Faraday cage in an area where it will also be protected from radiation. Let's just hop up back here and... You know, I don't know if this job called for... I don't know if it included crawling back into the... I got rid of all the mice before you got here. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Oh, my God. Do you have food stored back here, too? You bet I do. Staying below ground after a nuclear assault could reduce radiation exposure by 90%, making Janet's crawl space the safest shelter from nuclear fallout in her home for food and people. Behind your insulation? Oh my gosh, look at that. Janet knows there are thousands of nuclear weapons in the world, some of which are kept on hair trigger alert. If the doomsday clock strikes midnight, she wants all of her friends to know the door will be open at the Armageddon Inn. Hey, everybody. And the whole point behind the Armageddon Inn is to take in and help as many people as possible. We have decided a long time ago that if the big one hits, we're coming to your house. I know. We're bringing all and, of our own resources, and, too, but we're coming to your house. And that's exactly the, the thought that keeps me prepping, because I don't know how many people are going to show up. <laughs> there are communities that would pull together instead of falling apart. I hope that Helena is one of those communities. Janet, you have food and other supplies to last you for a long time. However, you are missing the basic prep should radiation spread to your area. We highly recommend getting a radiation meter. I think that is an excellent idea. That is something I will definitely take care of. Also, it is imperative you move some of your food supplies to a separate location because your kindness may be taken advantage of. The backup plan where that is concerned is a climate controlled storage unit which can be rented for $40 a month. Before the show airs I will definitely have one. It's been three months since the film crews left. They gave me some good advice and I have been busy following up on much of it. I found the cheapest, smallest climate controlled storage unit I could find. It's surrounded by a yard that has a 10 foot tall chain link fence topped with razor wire. So now I have the option of walking away from my house if I cannot defend it. A global arsenal of nearly 20,000 weapons makes the possibility of a nuclear incident a real tangible threat. However, the United States and Russia are moving towards a policy of nuclear disarmament aimed at reducing the likelihood of global nuclear war. At the age of 65, Colorado retiree Jack Job could be spending his golden years relaxing. Instead, he's gearing up to save his neighborhood from a catastrophic solar flare. Jack Job is a former Marine and a retired photojournalist who lives outside Denver, Colorado. Neighbors know Jack as a funny man who loves making his wife, Jackie, laugh. I want to have you for dinner. Uh, in fact, we're <laughs> serving Soylent Green. <laughs> and even trying his hand at stand-up at the local comedy club. I'm not afraid of dying in 2012. I just don't want to be there when it happens. But recently, Jack has gotten very serious about one thing, prepping. <laughs> I'm preparing for a massive solar flare that could set society back hundreds of years. Good <laughs> I'm a brand new prepper. <laughs> it all looks like learning to me still. I spend 24 hours a day prepping in the broad sense of things. The pivotal moment when I started prepping was after I saw the 2010 Haiti earthquake. It can only be described as a nightmare. Hundreds of thousands of dead. I had a huge revelation that my wife Jackie and I were totally unprepared. In January of 2010, Jack was one of millions across the world who watched as a 16-year-old girl was pulled from a pile of rubble 15 days after an earthquake killed a quarter of a million people in Haiti. They'd given up rescue. Uh, nobody should have survived that long. The rescue inspired many to believe in miracles. It made Jack believe in prepping. And in a moment, and I mean like that, I had this blinding flash. Human beings' lives change in an instant. Just bam. 
When I first realized that I needed to learn more about survival scenarios, I looked at everything from financial collapse, terrorist attack, um, not large natural events. Well, that brought me to solar flares. Two years ago, at the age of 63, Jack's life changed when he learned about solar flares, sudden bursts of energy released by the sun. A large solar flare can set off an electrical pulse with the energy of billions of Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. If a strong pulse reaches the Earth, it could wipe out all electronics in its path, effectively sending millions back to the 1800s. Experts predict there's a 12% chance this will happen in the next decade. If a solar flare massive enough to do this kind of damage hit right now, all of these vehicles would suddenly just cease to operate. Now people are all gonna grab their cell phone thinking their cars died. There's no cell phone service. Within moments, they're suddenly gonna realize this is something catastrophic beyond our wildest imagination. In Jack's apocalyptic vision, a solar flare fries the computer systems of all vehicles, leaving him stranded on the road miles from home. Thank goodness I've got enough preparation and I've got a 72-hour bag, but most of these people don't. I'd wave people away, and if they look like they're going to give me trouble, I'm armed. Now I'm faced with a 10-mile walk to get home. This would suddenly turn into a very, very dangerous world. Realizing that getting home by foot may be his only option after a solar flare, Jack knew he had to get himself in better physical condition. Everybody was uh, very skeptical about my prepping when I first got started because I basically had been a, a fat old lazy couch potato. He has lost 90 pounds in the two years since he started preparing, mostly because three days a week, he straps on his 72 hour bag and walks the neighborhood. Does me no good if the event happens and I can't lift the darn thing. So I began to carry it. And I realized that was a chance to talk to my neighbors about being prepared. My name is Jack. I live in a house across the street. Hi, Jack. Good to see you. What I do is on my business card, on the back, I show you just a few little things that I recommend people carry these days. It could save your life in an emergency. I'm encouraging people like yourself to learn first aid. So in an emergency, you're my doctor and I'm yours. If you had 10 minutes to get out of your house, what do you have to carry with you? What are you going to do if the neighbors come to you and they're out of food and you've got it? The more of my neighbors I can teach about solar flares, the more they're not going to be hunting Jackie and I down to kill us for our supplies. And I certainly don't want to have to be killing my neighbors. I'd rather talk to them about it. My canned goods in this one. All right. All right. Just because Jack likes chatting with neighbors about prepping doesn't mean he's telling them everything, like where he keeps his four months of food supplies. How about that rice box? That's good. This one here? Yeah. Only Jack's wife, Jackie, knows all the places he stashed food around their house. And you just yeah. tape it up? Sink parts. We look at how to put food in situations where we know where it's at, but other people that would come and visit would never notice it. Just lay it on its uh, on side, side, slide it all the way to the back, all okay. the way back in the corner. No, I am not a doomsday prepper. I'm married to a doomsday prepper. Tell me about your comedy routine. Being married to a doomsday prepper means that you understand you have to have patience. Jackie knows that the Haiti earthquake had a big impact on Jack, but she believes that's not the only reason he started prepping. We both have been laid off. I think Jack saw things were changing more quickly than they had in the past, and I think that gave him thought that we might be in a doomsday cycle right now. I'm having to now, at 64, <laughs> reteach myself all of those survival skills that I knew back when I was a teenager and young adult. Even as a beginning prepper, Jack considers it foolish to stock up without a plan to defend his supplies and his family. If a solar flare hit, society will just deteriorate into a ravaging pack of animals. Your life can go from great to just miserable in a moment. How are you set up to cope? If a catastrophic solar flare sends society into darkness and chaos, Jack fears that he and Jackie won't be able to hold off marauders forever. People that don't have preparations are going to go after people that are prepared. So he's putting the finishing touches on his post-apocalyptic bug-in strategy. 
At an age when most Americans are getting ready for retirement, Jack Job is getting ready for a second career as a prepper. In anticipation of social chaos after a massive solar flare, he's teaching his wife Jackie to fight with knives. I'm about this area of the kitchen, and I realized with this large door here, yes. we hadn't made any plans. As a first line of defense against home invaders, Jack tapes knives next to every entrance of the house. He also keeps extra knives under the counters and in the bedrooms. Jackie, it's taken quite a while for her to come around to the idea, but when she did, that's when we decided uh, we would practice, for example, knife training. If a solar flare brings looters to their door, Jackie knows to grab the nearest one. I now come in like I'm the intruder, putting more pressure on her in that stress, that adrenaline rush, that, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I want her to get used to that. I'm gonna give you a good <gasps> ride. <gasps> Lady, I'm gonna uh... come in here and make your life miserable. <laughs> the more you practice something, the more it becomes natural to you. If their home comes under siege, the Jobs believe their eight hidden knives will be more useful than one gun. Knives are light, easily concealed and silently deadly. Okay. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. All right. That's great, hon. Come on. That's great. Yep. I think you're ready. We've been through the entire batch of knives. All right. So we're ready. And if that's not enough to stop an invader, he has a backup plan. We're putting in a safe room, and the next thing we're going to do there, we've got to get a door on it. Safe rooms are fortified spaces that often hold food, water, and first aid items. They are recommended for hurricane and tornado-prone areas. But Jack has different concerns. You know, we had a huge, gigantic, the biggest recorded one in history, uh, solar flare in 2003. And the thing that scares me is we're not even to the peak until 2012 or 2013. And it's a matter of luck if the Earth's in the way. When... Jack's safe room contains 100 gallons of water, two months of food, and a 12-gauge shotgun. Today, his friend Mitch is helping him add the finishing touch a door that locks from the inside. And I just wanted something to help buy us time and keep Jackie safe. This should do it. You want to test the latch? Jack plans to retreat into the safe room with Jackie as a last resort if they can't hold off multiple invaders. OK, works good. OK. My dear, your new safe room. Wow, <laughs> this looks great. Show her how the boat Show works. Show me how this yeah. works. Come on, Nimi. I understand why we have a safe room. But the thought of having to lock myself in there is scary. I love this. OK, then just get it out. OK. You're ready to go. Oh, this is great. <laughs> I know. I thought you'd be excited. Yeah. Now, if you have an intruder, the first thing you do is you run in here, slam the bolt closed, and you load up the shotgun. OK. Realistically, Jack expects the door will only buy him a few minutes, just enough time to load a weapon. The moment we slam that bolt shut on that safe room, we've kind of made a declaration. The world is gone. We're either going to have to start killing people that are trying to kill us, or we're just going to have to kill ourselves. But I'd rather be prepared for it to happen, so I'm putting it in. I'm using myself as an example to say, hey, if I'm 65, you can certainly do some steps. The more prepared more people are, the more people that will survive and will be able to cooperate to build this neighborhood back the way it was. Jack, the experts, practical preppers, commend you for your outreach to your neighbors. Additionally, it is good that you are getting in shape, as this will greatly increase your chances of survival. I will definitely continue the physical training. It's been a blessing already with losing the weight. However, your safe room is not enough to protect you and Jackie. You need to establish a defensive perimeter around your home if you want true security from invaders. I do want to lay in uh, a lot of traps around the yard, camouflage holes, and have uh, spikes and things set up throughout the yard. <laughs> Since our Net Geo television appearance and the first couple of episodes are out, my wife Jackie is actually more interested in prepping. And what I've done is taken the expert's advice about beefing up our home security. Here's the first of three pieces that'll fit inside of each of our windows. 
in the event of looters. The chances of a devastating solar flare destroying the power grid for millions of people is as high as 12% over the next 10 years. However, the majority of solar flares pose no threat to life on Earth.